So we've been looking at some of the different ways the scriptures describe the birth of Jesus. What are the ones we focused on so far? Remember, the word became flesh or the word was made flesh. That was one. Then the second one, the light shone in the darkness. Those both describe aspects of what took place through this event that we celebrate here at Christmas. Jesus' birth was the living word, God himself, coming into this world as a human being. And his coming was the one true light shining in the dark world. But the description that we're looking at today is probably the one that's most familiar to us. Probably because it comes from the part of the Christmas story that we tend to read or hear about a lot this time of year. And it's the fact that when Jesus came, it was a Savior being born. A Savior being born. Who said that or made that announcement? You remember? It was an angel of the Lord, the one who appeared to the shepherds. In Luke 2.11, it records the angel telling the shepherds, For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Let's just take time to read that fuller passage there. Just in case you haven't heard it or read it this season, it just wouldn't seem like Christmas if, if we didn't. But Luke chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. But that pronouncement there that a Savior was born, that speaks to the purpose of Jesus' birth. It gets right to the heart of why the Word became flesh. And it tells us the reason the light shone in the darkness. Jesus came to be our Savior. He came to save us. Now, there are other things that Jesus did, but you notice the angel didn't focus on those. He didn't say to the shepherds that a great teacher is born to you in Bethlehem, or a healer is born, or a prophet is born. Jesus did those things. He taught. He healed the sick. He proclaimed truth. But those weren't the main reason he came. His primary purpose, his main mission, was to come into this world to be our Savior. That was our greatest need, and that was his main reason for coming into this world. He came to save us. I was thinking about some of those people who were caught in that tornado in Kentucky recently. I heard one man telling about how the roof lifted off the building he was in and the walls just came falling in on him and others. He said he was near the bottom of the pile. He couldn't move. He said he was able to, to move one arm a little bit to kind of help himself be on his side a little bit, be able to raise up enough so that he could breathe because he had all this rubble just pinning him down and putting pressure on his body. And he was stuck there. He had somebody else nearby also trapped and they would talk to each other and encourage each other, but they couldn't get out. They couldn't save themselves. All they could do was to wait for somebody to come and rescue them. And finally, the rescuers were able to get enough of the rubble off of them that they could get them out. Well, the Jews in Jesus's day, they had been looking for somebody to rescue them. 
They were stuck under the oppression and rule of the Romans at that time. They couldn't free themselves from this powerful Roman force. And they were waiting for a savior. They thought that he would be the one who would establish an earthly kingdom, freeing them from the Romans and giving the Jewish people their homeland back. You know, that was more their idea of the Savior and what he would do. That, that's who they were looking for and who they were waiting on. But of course, Jesus was more than a political Savior for the Jewish people. Jesus came to be the Savior of the whole world. He saw more than the Jews stuck under Roman rule. He saw a world that was stuck under the weight of sin. And he knew that the greatest need people had, including the Jews, that the greatest need that they had was to be saved from their sin, to be freed from spiritual bondage. And that's something that we're also helpless to free ourselves from. You know, just like that man stuck in that collapsed building, until we experience salvation through Christ, we're stuck. And we can't do anything about our spiritual condition. We can't fight against sin in our own strength and win. We can't be good enough to crawl out of our sinful condition. We will inevitably do bad things or, or do them from the wrong motives and just sink further and further down in the rubble. There's no way out on our own. We need a rescuer. And that's where Jesus came in. He was born to be our savior. He didn't just come to shine the light on our helpless situation but to deliver us from the darkness, to bring us out of that kingdom of darkness and bring us into the kingdom of light. He came to free us from the awful weight of sin and shame and guilt that kept us down and to set us free to live life the way God intended, life in a right relationship with him and enjoying fellowship with him and being the holy people he calls us to be. That's why the angel referred to this event as good news. Remember the angel said, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings, good news, good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people, not just the Jews, but to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior. Now the fact that a Savior was born is what made it such good news. Now, the, the other descriptions of Jesus' birth that we've looked at, they wouldn't have necessarily been good news if it wasn't for the fact that Jesus was coming to be our Savior. That first description we looked at, the Word became flesh. Certainly that was interesting news, important news, and even amazing news. You know, that I, the, the idea that, that God was taking on flesh and blood it's an incredible concept to think about. By, by the way, our three-year-old grandson is already wrestling with some of these amazing truths about God and about Jesus. He's asking questions about you know, God being invisible and where God lives and even asking how Jesus can be God if there's just one God. So, so his parents are already having to try to figure out how to explain the Trinity to a three-year-old. It's hard enough for us adults to grasp that concept, isn't it? And the fact that God came to this earth in the form of a human being is amazing and mind-boggling. But it's not necessarily good news depending on why it is that he came. I mean, if God was coming into this world to bring judgment on our sin and judgment on this world and just wipe us all out or scoop us all up to throw us into the pit of hell... That wouldn't be good news, would it? But what makes it good news is the fact that he was coming to save us. And the same thing with that other description of Jesus' birth we focused on last Sunday. That Jesus' birth was when the light shone in the darkness. Again, by itself, that's not necessarily good news. Because like we pointed out last week, the light can shine and show us the way things really are. The light can shine in the world and show us just how sinful and lost we are and reveal how much we need saving. But that's not good news just by itself. Again, going back to the tornado victims, that tornado hid in the dark of night. 
after the building collapsed and they were stuck in the dark, they knew that they were in trouble and that they were in need. But, you know, I don't know, maybe they couldn't tell how bad it was until someone came along and shone a spotlight on the area, or, or maybe even until the sun started coming up the next morning and the sky started brightening. Then they could see that they weren't just stuck under one fallen beam. No, the virtually the whole part of that building had collapsed, and they were under a big pile of beams and rubble. The light shows us our need, but it doesn't necessarily save us. It just reveals that we need saving. So the good news is that a Savior is born. Not just that God came into the world, but that He came to save us. And not just that a light shone in the darkness, but that the light also came to give us life. He came to, to help us see our need and then do something about it. He came to show us our sin, but not to stop with that. He came to show us our sin and then save us from that sin. So the fact that a Savior is born is what makes everything else we remember about Jesus' birth so meaningful and so joyful. It's what makes it the good news that it is. A Savior was born. But what if one of those victims stuck in that rubble refused to admit their need to be rescued? I know it's ridiculous to even think about it. Uh, someone pinned under the debris, but telling rescuers when they came, Oh, I'm okay. You, know, you don't need to pull me out. I'm fine right here. If you could just bring me a little food and water and maybe build a little shelter over me so I don't get wet when it rains or bring a heater in so I can stay warm, I'll be fine. No, you know that, that's crazy. And yet that's what some people do regarding their need for salvation. They may try to ignore their condition and say that they're not in bondage to sin. And even when the light of God's word shows them the truth about their condition, they refuse to accept the help of their rescuer or savior. I forget where I heard it, but someone recently pointed out that we've got to acknowledge the bad news before we can receive the good news. The bad news is that we're sinners. We're lost. We're trapped in bondage to sin and there's no way we can get out of it in our own strength. Unless we admit that and comes to, come to terms with it, we're not going to be ready and willing to accept God's help to get out of that condition. We've got to see that we need to be saved. And then, then we can receive the good news. God sent his son into this world to save us. And that's what John 3.16 tells us, doesn't it? That for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Good news, a Savior was born. But we've got to realize that we're perishing and that we need a Savior. We've got to admit the bad news in order to receive the good news of a Savior. Two Sundays ago, I mentioned a line from Charles Wesley's Christmas hymn, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, about the Word becoming flesh, where, where it says in that song, Veiled in flesh the, gods, the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity. Now, I could have quoted another part of it last Sunday, that same song, when we talked about Jesus being the light. Because another part says, Hail the Son, S-U-N, Hail the Son of Righteousness, light and life to all he brings. And I will go back to it today because at the end of that third verse in our hymnals, it gets to the heart of why Jesus came and this truth of his coming to be our savior. It says about why he was born, born that men no more may die, born to raise the sons of earth, born to give them second birth. Jesus was born to be our Savior. And what does that song suggest that means? Jesus was born so that we no more may die. I mean, we, we may die and will die physically unless Jesus comes back first, but we don't die spiritually and eternally. We're saved from hell and saved to have eternal life and life in heaven with the Lord. It also says, He was born to raise the sons of earth. Jesus came to raise us up, 
to free us from sin slavery, to lift us up out of that rubble of guilt and shame and sin that we were buried under and to give us new life and to enable us to live a life of fellowship with him and a life of purpose as his followers. He raises us up to a wonderful new life in right relationship with him. And then it says, born to give them second birth. That's what gets us there. That's the door we need to enter in in order to receive life and salvation. Jesus said, you must be born again. Jesus was born so that we can be reborn, so that we could experience a spiritual birth. John talks about it there in that first chapter of John that we've looked at over the previous two Sundays. And if you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn back over there and look at verses 12 through 13 in that first chapter. It talks in the previous verse there about how many rejected Christ and didn't receive him when he came into this, this world. But then in verses 12 and 13, it says this, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. Those who received him, those who saw their need to be saved and trusted Jesus to save them, they were born of God and were given the right or, or the power and the authority to become children of God. They came to have that relationship where they call God their father and have that kind of close family-like intimacy with him. Jesus was born so that we could experience this event in our lives. Being born into God's kingdom and born into his family to receive the gift of eternal life. That's why Jesus came. He was born so we could be reborn. I don't know how many of you remember or ever watched any of the Indiana Jones movies. In my favorite one of the series, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, toward the end of the story, they had found the treasure that they were looking for, the Holy Grail, that cup that Christ supposedly drank from at the Last Supper. But then, you know, somebody did something wrong. They tried to take the cup out of the cave that, that it was in. And everything started falling apart, kind of like tends to happen in those movies at some point. In this case, the ground opened up and the cup slid down onto a ledge within that crevice. And a lady who was part of the group that was so intent on finding it, she slid and fell into that hole too. But Indiana, he was able to grab hold of one of her gloved hands to try to save her. But she saw that cup on the ledge just below her and thought she could reach it with her other hand. Indiana frantically told her to, to give him her other hand, that he couldn't hold on to her. But she kept reaching for that cup. So as she kept stretching to reach that cup, her hand slipped out of the glove that Indy was holding, and she fell to her death. But then Indiana himself slipped and fell in, and his dad grabbed his hand, Indiana told him he thought he could reach the cup. I mean, after all, this was the great treasure that his dad had searched for all his life. But through this adventure they had gone through, his dad had come to realize that the life of his son, his relationship with him, was more important than that cup. So he told Indiana to let it go. Let it go. So Indy turned away from the cup and reached up with his other hand, and so his dad was able to grab both of his hands and pull him up to safety. I'm afraid there are people who are like that about the salvation that Jesus came to give us. He came to be our Savior, but too many are focused on something else. They're reaching towards some treasure in this life, something they value in this world. And they aren't willing to let it go and reach out fully with both hands to Jesus and let him save them. They want to try to let him have maybe one hand while they're still reaching for something else. Maybe it's just their own will and their own ways that they're reaching toward and insisting on. But there's something they're not willing to give up, and it costs them their soul. I hope that all of us here have come to that place where we've turned our backs on all the other things in this world that would lure us away from God, and we've reached out with both hands 
to let him save us from perishing and to raise us up to a life of peace with him, to be born of the Spirit and to experience life in this world as a spiritually alive follower of Jesus. If anyone hasn't, if anyone is dangling in sin's pit and still reaching back toward those things that you have a hard time giving up, Jesus is saying this morning, let it go. Let it go. Give me both hands. Give yourself to me and trust me fully and let me save you. That's what he was born to do. That was his purpose in coming. That's the good news that we're celebrating here at Christmas. A Savior was born. Have you let him be your Savior? If so, then let's rejoice in him as our Savior. But if not, then I hope you'll reach out and let him take your hand and raise you up spiritually to new life in him today.